Welcome to uh, Jules and I's Working From Home Conversations. Today, we're very lucky to be joined by Grace Forrest, the co-founder of Walk Free, and Serena Grant, who's the business lead. And thank you so much for joining us today. So during this hugely challenging time, we wanted to hear your perspective on what's going on, um, how COVID is affecting what you're doing for Walk Free and affecting the nature of the world that we know it as. So we'll get into a couple of questions. So Grace, could you just tell us a bit about Walk Free and tell our listeners a bit about it? Yeah, absolutely. So Walk Free is an international human rights group focused on the eradication of modern slavery in all its forms in our lifetime. And um, we're lucky to have Serena with us today. We work on business engagement. We work um, on global policy with governments. We work with the religious leaders throughout the world. And probably most poignantly for this conversation, we're the producer of the Global Slavery Index, which is the world's leading data set on measuring and understanding slavery in every country throughout the world. Awesome. Grace, it's so nice to see you again. And to our listeners, we've got um, half of us are in England and Serena and Grace are in Australia. So this is a truly global work from home conversation. Serena, it would be great to hear more about the recent report you've produced, Protecting People in a Pandemic, um, and looking at how COVID is affecting the modern slavery crisis. Yeah, so our report's looking at how COVID's impacting migrant workers and other vulnerable workers. And what we're, what we're finding is that in addition to the health risks, which are perhaps more obvious, there's, there's really a lot of social and economic risks that, that are happening that are really impacting migrant workers and vulnerable people. Um, we're talking about people here that really have no sa social safety net. So they might be living on a, um, on a wage where they're reliant on that wage uh, for meals on a daily basis, and they're excluded from government support. So, for example, if you look at the construction industry, um, we've had examples from Qatar where we saw migrant workers essentially being barricaded into industrial zones with confirmed cases of COVID and really at risk in terms of not being able to access healthcare, not having adequate, adequate supplies to food and water. Um, and I think it, it's this combination of the health risks and the existing vulnerabilities of these workers that are, are really concerning. So if you're in a foreign country and you lose your job um, and you've got no access to things like government support, like unemployment benefits, and then because of the travel restrictions and lack of commercial flights, you're unable to return home and there's no other jobs available it's you're really in a very difficult situation and i think we're at the moment we're talking about risks to people's lives so those economic risks combined with the health risks and impacts of COVID are really quite concerning for us um, there's other industries as well all around the world where we've got real real concerns the fishing industry is one globally um, we've got examples from India where I think around 25,000 fishermen have been reported to be stranded off the coast there, um, again, without adequate supplies of food and water. So wow. unable to fish and support themselves, but then they've also got nowhere else to go. So they're sort of stuck on these boats. And some are in international waters, some are in um, other countries like Iran. I think there were about 800 stranded in Iran. Um, so we're seeing all these emergency sort of situations arise around the world and I don't really think that enough is being done about it. There's not an emergency response to it. Yeah, and, and Serena, you actually wrote um, the, the slavery report, didn't you? You're the, you're the key author. Yes, I am, but I, I won't take full credit. I mean, the report is really based on a lot of the other reports that are out there from our partners around the world. So grassroots civil society organisations through to the ILO, the IOM, you know, this report sort of collates all of those recommendations and reports that are out there um, and tries to sort of bring it into one cohesive piece. And also being a practical guide because there there is sparse information on this as, you know, I can see you guys watching, listening to Serena. We should be hearing more about this in the media and we're just not. So we're really um, honoured at Walk Free to work with key partners on this, to bring together these messages, to hopefully have a direct line for shifts in attitude and hopefully actions for government and business. So the main focus for this, this report is to, is to really get, it, get to the heart of the government and businesses so that they can respond to the most effective way so that people they can help you know affect change in different communities 
Absolutely. I think we're seeing um, need on so many levels here um, in this pandemic. But I think one thing which is a misconception is that statement that COVID-19 is a great equaliser. It, of course, is not an equaliser. Those who are most vulnerable in our societies and throughout the world are being hit by this on a level that for many of us, we can't even imagine. So we really wanted to create a practical guide for what businesses and governments could do um, because many of them are dealing with met so many levels of um, problems here and equally establishing Walk Free as a watchdog in this situation to say, we will be watching and measuring your response and the public will be aware. The report says that from a corporate social responsibility perspective, that this was a disaster waiting to happen. Perhaps you could elaborate on that. Yeah, so I think that statement really speaks to the existing vulnerability that we are all aware of um, in regards to modern slavery in the world today. It's no news to everyone on this call that there are more people living in slavery today than any other time in human history. And when we have a disaster, whether this unprecedented pandemic or um, a natural disaster, it is the most vulnerable people who take the hardest hit. Um, so Pre-COVID-19, we already knew that migrant workers were the most vulnerable within the supply chains, were the ones to have the least protection and the first ones to be dropped when a disaster occurs, um, which is simply unacceptable from a human rights perspective, but within the context of a public health crisis, also very problematic for businesses who plan to return to any kind of business as usual. Looking at these workers as people that are um, effectively disposable in a lot of ways, this is as I said, completely unacceptable from a human rights perspective, but also really not clever from an economic perspective because they are essential parts of the global economy, essential workers within supply chains and to not protect them um, is putting ourselves in a situation which we actually can't really measure or understand at this stage. Wow. Um, and Serena, obviously there's an issue now globally with, with PPE um, and social distancing and, and the fact that in a lot of the countries that modern slavery is most prevalent, social distancing really can't be possible. Um, mm -hmm. what, what, are, what are other ways that businesses can help the, the most vulnerable or can protect people? And, and what are the ways that sort of we can all get involved? Yeah, so I think, I think beyond those more obvious health measures that businesses can take, I mean, financial support is really key here. So I think businesses need to be innovative about how they provide that support. If you're a brand, think about how you can provide a bit of liquidity to your suppliers so that they can continue to play workers. Um, as Grace was just saying, you know, that's part of the global supply chain. And once this crisis passes, they're going to want those suppliers and those workers to still be there. So I think that's really imperative that they try to provide as much support as possible, whether direct funds for the workers or um, perhaps shortening payment terms to the suppliers or thinking of other ways they can support them. You know, I, I think one of the, the good examples in the report you think about all these sales channels that have suddenly shut down because of COVID. So in Croatia, uh, farmers markets have been banned because of social distancing, but then there's a supermarket chain that has said, okay, well, let's take all of the farmers produce and we'll sell it in our supermarkets and continue to support the economy that way. And I think we need to see a lot more innovation like that, that thinks about the supply chain, that thinks about the workers um, and, and how they can be best protected. Um, the, the other area I'd say businesses really need to think about is just thinking about where the biggest risk is. So we, we say this in human rights due diligence terms all the time. We say, look at your supply chain, assess the, assess the salient human rights risks or modern slavery risks and figure out what to do about it. And I think that's the same thing that needs to happen here. If you've got migrant workers in your workforce, if you know that they're stuck, they can't go home, they've become unemployed, perhaps their home country has shut uh, borders to citizens, that's a really at-risk group and you need to think about how you're going to address that. Perhaps you need to have conversations with the government in their home country or in the country that you're in and figure out what to do about it. it it's not acceptable to just say we made these people unemployed and they can't go anywhere and now they're starving. Like that, That's just not yeah. acceptable in this day and age and I think as, as this crisis passes, brands are going to be held accountable if they do that. Um, so we at the Anti-Slavery Collective have collaboration at the very, very core of our mission. 
And it was so great reading your report to see how much you guys are encouraging collaboration between governments and businesses. What do you think that looks like? And can you highlight any good examples of that? Yeah, sure. So I think, I think perhaps the first one is around communication. So I think um, if you imagine for us, like right now, it's quite complicated to even figure out what the travel restrictions are or quarantine restrictions or lockdown, what you can and can't do. Imagine you're then in a foreign country, in a different language, you limited access to internet and news, and you're in a pretty scary and frightening situation. So I think having governments talk with businesses to make sure workers are getting key messages around what is COVID-19? What are the symptoms? How do you access testing? How do you access healthcare? Um, if you've got an irregular immigration status, if you've overstayed your visa, what does that mean? Can you still get tested or are you going to get in trouble? These are all things that are really critical, not just to protect vulnerable workers, but also to contain the spread of the virus to everyone. Um, I think the the other part of that is working directly with migrant worker groups. So migrant worker representatives or trade unions is, is really important to collaborate to make sure that those messages are getting across. Um, I think the second part of the collaboration is perhaps more, more of the examples I was giving before around brands and suppliers working together or perhaps host and destina destination countries working together. I think we need to see quite urgent bilateral engagement between these countries saying, um, you know, we've got a million workers in your country, what's going to happen to them or what is happening to them, happening to them. Um, we've seen some good examples and I think we've referenced a few of those throughout the report, particularly um, funds that have been created to protect workers, whether that's government funded or um, business funded and suppliers and brands working together. But I think we need- In the last, in the last few, few months because of COVID that's happened. Yes, yeah, right. there's a few good examples of that. Um, there was one interesting one, actually, the EU has created a $5 million fund to uh, help workers in Myanmar. And, um, you know, I think that that's sort of more of an aid funding thing, but I think we, we're going to need a lot more collaboration and a lot more funding to even start to address um, some of the vulnerabilities that we're seeing at this scale. And Serena, in terms of <clears throat> governments, I mean, they have a lot on their plate right now, obviously, and they're thinking about sort of, you know, many, many different sects of society. How, how do you think that people will sort of turn towards the issue of modern slavery now during the pandemic? I mean, I know that's um, probably... Yeah, no, it's, know, it's a good... It's a good question. We do a lot of government engagement at Walk Free and we have found that governments are saying, you know, actually we're, we're just completely in crisis mode now. But, you know, our response is, well, this is actually a crisis. This is part of the COVID response. It has to be part of the COVID response. Yeah. Um, there is no point in saving a population from from COVID only to have them starve because they've been in lockdown and unable to support themselves and access food and water. Like we're talking about pretty fundamental humanitarian issues here. Um, so I think it absolutely must be on the agenda and, and saving, people, saving people's lives have to be as much a priority as, um, as containing the virus. Yeah. And Serena, I just, you go. No, I, I'm just gonna say that, you know, you spoke briefly earlier about someone who whose visas ended in a country and they don't know now if they can go and get tested and you know I a lot of these times we've had these calls you know you don't I can't sometimes you don't put yourself right in the situation of that person but to think that someone would be scared they're going to be deported or they're going to get in trouble or they can't mm -hmm. go and actually get access to their medical needs or whatever it is it, it, it does it sort of it puts it all into perspective really about what really this crisis is, is, is doing to people. Just echoing Serena's point here, um, when Serena said a million workers before, she wasn't just pulling that out of the air. We've literally been told this week that there are 1.1 million Sri Lankan workers stuck overseas right now. And these are people who um, are certainly within that bracket of relying on that income for day-to-day -day needs. Um, it goes well beyond just that 1.1 million group, which is already an inconceivable number really to consider to 1.1 million families who are relying on 
that remittances to then a national level of knowing that remittances make up the second highest contribution to Sri Lanka's GDP. So again, we're talking about an absolute humanitarian crisis here where people are being excluded from public health safety nets in the countries where they're being stuck. Again, this is coming back to everything from government scrambling what they've got to xenophobia and racism towards these groups and harsh exclusion. Um, but equally, the economic implications for one person, for one family, but then one community, one state, one entire country being in a situation where they've lost that income, it, the global implications are absolutely huge. And I think, um, of course, we all believe in this from a human rights perspective, but keeping it on the moral and economic forefront of people's minds, as Serena said, um, when people say to us, this is a crisis, we can't deal with that. This crisis is hand in hand together and one that we've got a very small window to proactively work against. If we miss it, as I said, um, there are long term challenges that we, we can't even comprehend at this point. So who's working to repatriate, repatriate these 1.1 million Sri Lankan workers? <laughs> this is a question that we are actually <laughs> currently trying to figure out ourselves. Um, Again, the partners that we have that we're working with there who are so um, that are passionate members of the business community, um, they're questions that they have not been able to get answers to. And um, again, the question that keeps coming up is, well, who's meant to pay for that? And what happens with the spread? And for a country like Sri Lanka that hasn't had a significant spread yet, obviously that is really scary to bring it back if people are unable to socially or financially isolate. These are complicated problems, but I think at the very least, people need to have assurance that their loved ones are going to be taken care of on a basic level where they are stuck. Um, and again, these are conversations and questions that need to be on the forefront of transnational conversations from a business and government perspective. Grace, what can our listeners do? What can the consumer do? Everyone listening today who's not a business or a government, how can they pay, play their part in this pandemic? What people can do, and I think especially as consumers speaking to the garment industry particularly, is keep asking questions. Ask your favourite brands what they are doing in the midst of this pandemic and demand answers because we really do have a right to know. Now, we know that many brands have cancelled orders throughout this time and are refusing to pay. Unfortunately, they are legally entitled to do that, but it has devastating impacts on the most vulnerable people in the supply chain. Like, who can imagine that it's Bangladeshi workers our age who are skilled, working hard every single day to make the clothes we all wear, they're taking the biggest hit, not a multinational million dollar company who can actually absorb and work to protect these workers. It's, it's inconceivable to think that the mo those most vulnerable take the hardest brunt. Now, one example of this, and I, I'm cautious to call out one brand because this really is an industry that is vulnerable. The entire fashion industry is vulnerable here. And every single brand you can think of, tag, ask, you deserve to know the answers to that. And I bet many of them are not gonna be able to give them, but starting these conversations is so important. So one example of a company um, that has been hung out to dry a bit here is Primark. They were criticized very widely for canceling orders that were already in production. Um, workers not being paid for goods that they had already produced. Now that understandably and really importantly led to a public outcry. It led to an outcry within our space, but also into the public sphere of people wanting to be able to have some kind of assurance that these brands are doing something to protect vulnerable people in this time. And as a result, Primark has now announced a wage fund for garment workers. So um, this is not a silver bullet and it's definitely not to say it excuses them not doing that in the first place. But what it does show is that public pressure really does work. And again, Primark taking this first step is really important and it should be celebrated. Um, but this is something that every major brand should be doing. And as I said, if we've learned anything from that process of this one group being hung out to dry when really everyone is in the spotlight here and should be, is that if we put the pressure on and if we ask these questions, it can lead to tangible change for vulnerable people on every level of the supply chain, especially people on the level which often well, are always the first ones to be affected and be cut off. I think we all underestimate the power that we have as consumers. People have been saying to us is that, you know, the main issue in a lot of these places is starvation rather than actually the, the COVID because it's what happens when 
people take out their money and take take away their resources and what's left behind as you rightly say it's the, the most vulnerable are, are the targets yeah just to end now on a on a sort of moment of hope we Jules and I love talking about um, a story of hope and both of you we'd love to hear from you about something that's 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 been wonderful that's come out of, of something that's been so challenging for so many people and we've heard from different people that it's about people coming together and collaborating more it's about data sharing but we'd love um, if you have to, to end on a story of hope I'm not sure if this is a story of hope but it, I, I do have hope here so I think um, I, I think this is an opportunity for us to sort of reimagine migration like I think all of the things we've talked about these systemic problems the lacks of protection for workers um, this has all sort of been laid bare by the pandemic and we know that this is not the, the last crisis that we're going to see whether it's a natural disaster or another financial crisis we know these things happen and so if we continue to rely um, on workforces who are so vulnerable to these financial shocks what's the answer when those shocks come who's responsible is it the government is it the business you know the 1.1 million workers we were talking about what what happens there and so I think those conversations are the ones I'm really hopeful about and really interested in us as Walk Free being a part of and bringing others along with us to say, well, how do we change these systems so that those financial shocks don't result in salvation or modern slavery? Um, but that, that's my hope, is that we, this, this changes things for the most vulnerable in the supply chain. Thank you. Great. And um, unfortunately, I don't have a single story of hope to give you right now. We are watching it closely, um, but I would shadow um, Sarita's comments there very strongly saying, we're in a position now where many industries are having to reassess in the short term and it's gonna be the longer term, how they procure goods. And I think it is really time that as consumers, as government leaders, as influential people in whatever sphere we're in, we, it's time that we understand what is the true cost of labor. And it's time that we, really assess the systemic change that needs to occur in order to have basic protection for all people. I don't think anyone wants to buy something that harmed another human being or the environment in the process. And yet pre-COVID-19, that was absolutely the norm. Finding something ethically or sustainably made was the exception to the rule. And I think this is a t moment in time where we are forced to stand still and we're encouraging people, especially people in leadership positions in government and business, to take this opportunity not to return to business as usual, but to reassess what business as usual actually means. Can I also just congratulate you both on this, this report because it's really been illuminating for Jules and I, and I think it might not be hopeful what the content is, but I really believe that what you're doing is a hopeful mission to to change people's mindsets and also create um, change within government. And as you say, you know, this is not gonna be business as usual, hopefully after this things change. So congratulations and thank you to you. I agree. Thank you for having us. Thank yeah, you so thank much. you both. Thank you, Grace, from the Walk Free Foundation. To Eugenie and I, you guys represent hope. Um, I think there are three main takeaways from today's conversation. The first is that those that are most vulnerable are getting hit the hardest. That is not okay. The second is collaboration. Governments and businesses need to work together. And I think the third, and this one is for our listeners, for the consumers, you have the power to put pressure on big businesses and big governments. So let's do everything we can, especially in this time, to support. Thank you for joining us.